DJ thought he'd stay out of Highway 77 after the big NBA thing. That lasted about three months. And he stayed. He figured it out. I did that for three years. In fact, I came here to teach. Stupid. I'm not too bright. At that time, I'm so close to 80 now, I have to have a cane. an idea. <laughs> One of them asked me the other day, what was the biggest problem Jesus had with the Pharisees? I said they asked too many questions. <laughs> Tony, Tony, Tony. <laughs> hey, Tony. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, boy, is Jeff. One of our elders. Hey, Cecil. How you doing? Dorothy and I have four great grandchildren. If Becky will sit down, we'll start. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, they're awake and eating. I don't get that anymore. This is a much better looking class than we had last week. Thank you for coming. We're studying the Sermon on the Mount. It's on page 6 of my New Testament. Chapter 5 in Matthew, verse 10 when we start. Before we do that, there's a special prayer request this morning for Charlene Yarborough, who lives in Centralia, Illinois. She's a friend of Sabrina Fowl, and she is facing a heart transplant. So you'll want to keep Charlene Yarborough in your prayers, please. 
The Elkins family needs to be in your prayers. Uh, we're still remembering Nancy Price and Carolyn Hayes at their recent losses. Someone else I should mention. Who is it? The Crow family. What happened, Jim? Marilyn did. When did that happen? Thursday night. And the funeral will be Brantley? Bradford. Ashley just told me that Brenda Wood's mother died. Uh, she's been ill a long time. What, when was that, Ashley? Yesterday. Annie there. Is she in the nursing home? Hmm. She's talking about Annie Elkins, yes. She's at Covert now. Oh, she is. Be out there in a couple of weeks. But okay. We have a visitor with us this morning uh, that I've known for several years now, and he's a good friend. He's been on our lectureship several times. This is Rick Bombeck. He is the director of the School of Preaching in Austin, Texas. His wife is with him this morning, two of his sons. His son Philip is starting with us in a couple of weeks. We're going to be persecuting him. He has a son, Edmund, and a daughter, Catherine. He said he just, she just got married. And so we're glad that Rick's here. I'm going to ask him to do some prayer, please. Give him a moment of this teaching before we start. Will you bow with me, please? Our Holy Father, we come before you this morning thankful for a new Lord's Day and the chance to begin, to begin it by worshiping and studying with our brothers and sisters in the faith and being in your presence. Father, there are a number of names that have been mentioned. We want to mention Charlene Yarbrough and pray your blessings upon her as she is facing a heart transplant. A number of other members and friends who need uh, your blessings, and we want to pray for those who have lost loved ones. Several names were mentioned, Father. We pray that we might be of an encouragement, uh, support to them. We pray that we might also take advantage of the opportunities to remind them, us, and others, Father, about the fact that Life is brief, and we want to be prepared to enter eternity and to be with you. Father, we pray for this class this morning on the Sermon on the Mount. Pray for Brother Mosier as he leads our thoughts. Pray that we'll open our minds and allow your word and your principles to sink deeply into our thoughts and shape our lives. We pray for all of the classes that are being conducted here and the works of this great congregation. Bless us, Father. May we grow to be more like your son, Jesus the Christ, every single day. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Matthew 5.10, the Christian and persecution. Makarios, blessed. Remember, that's different from happy. Happy does not translate this term very well. Blessed are ye, are they, which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Underline that. Now notice the end of this, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It seems highly likely that this is the last of the Beatitudes in this sermon and that the next two verses just expand the thought of this particular Beatitude. Some have counted verse 11 as another Beatitude. It seems to me that he's simply expanding the thought of verse 10, but Maybe not. This beatitude differs from the other. It's not so much a description of a Christian as it is the account of what will happen when he incorporates all those other beatitudes in his life. This is what we should expect if we're going to be Christians. Persecution. Christian is persecuted because he's a certain kind of person. Is this thing on? Did it go off again?
Notice something very strange here. This beatitude follows, blessed are the peacemakers. And then all of a sudden, persecution. And the promise attached to this beatitude is the same as the first one. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Interesting connection there. What a strange thing to be persecuted because I'm a peacemaker. Isn't that rather a dichotomy of some kind, a paradox? But it follows. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted. Follows right after it. It's rather strange. And theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we start with the kingdom, we end with it. He's just describing, as me, a Christian living in this world who is a member of the kingdom of God. Thus you start and you end in the same place. You're a citizen of the kingdom. You empty yourself and you end up being persecuted. That's what you should expect. It sounds rather strange to my ear when I read it. So it's important to understand what I am in the kingdom and what happens when I'm in it. And that's the whole point, I think, of these Beatitudes. We're faced again with something that causes us to search ourselves. This is not an appendix to the other Beatitudes. Uh, it's not some addition that he put here just to be saying something. This persecution belongs to the Christian just as much as being poor in spirit or meek or mourning over one sin or whatever it is, it all belongs to us. I think it is, uh, what's the point, word I want? This beatitude points out how honest Christ is. He never told us that this life would be easy. He never indicated that in any way that just become a Christian, everything will come up roses. No, I never promised you a rose garden. And he never taught that way. In fact, he taught in just an opposite way. He told us on one occasion, the ma servant is not greater than his master, and they persecuted the master. So he's very honest in the way he does that. Of course, you would expect that of the Son of God. Here's what it, you must expect when you incorporate a true Christian life as your life. He never left men in doubt as to what would happen when they became his disciples. If any man will come after me, let him what? Deny himself. How revolutionary that was in the day that he said it. Because the Greek philosophers had been telling people, know yourself. And he came along and said, that isn't how to be blessed. The way to be blessed is to deny yourself. I heard about a fellow in services. The preacher said something, and the fellow yelled out, Amen, Eureka, I found it. And on the way home, his wife said, What in the world happened to you this morning? You never shout like that in services. He said, I just forgot myself. Well, that's what we need to do as Christians. We need to forget ourselves. It's not easy to do. It is not the easiest thing at all. But he said, don't be in doubt. You live this life, you'll be persecuted. It also emphasizes something else. This is hard, but he did not come into this life to make life easy for us. That's not what happened. I was not called to a padded pew. I was called to an old, rugged, wooden cross. And that's not an easy thought. And it seems to me that it underscores my failure sometimes to understand what Christianity really is. I think I think if it's easy, I'll accept it. But if it's not, I don't want to have anything to do with it. How many people do you know who quit the church because somebody said something he didn't like? Just said something he didn't like. The Hebrews writer talked about those who had not endured into blood yet. 
you got through yesterday, you can get through today. He didn't call us to an easy life. And that underscores something that I forget all the time. When he came into the world, he came to make life a sword. A separation from the world and sometimes from our own families. Let's look at 1 John 3, 14. You want to know the test to know whether or not you are a true Christian? Here it is. Somebody read that for us. 1 John 3, 14, please. Jerry Manning, would you read that? Stop there a minute. We know what? We know it. He said, "What? Well, here's the test. Watch it. Here is the test. Because, wow. Isn't that a simple test? No, it's a hard test. Am I going to quit and give up just because the air conditioner went out some Sunday? I've seen it. Brother Bradley told us one time about a lady who called him and said her dog died. Brother Bradley commiserated with her about the loss of her dog, and she quit coming to church because he didn't visit. You laugh, but it happens even worse than that. Talking this morning about a couple quit coming because somebody he thought said something about him. Had somebody said something about me, and I've just walked up and said, Did you say, you know, just ask, go to the person. But we're not called to an easy life. But most of us need to underscore that. Because for too many, if it's not easy, they don't want to have anything to do with it. For years, I've heard about the sacrifices that students make to come to the Memphis School of Preaching. I may be the only instructor that doesn't believe that. I don't think it's a sacrifice. It was a great blessing in my life. Man, we moved from old ghetto down to a five-bedroom house to live in while I went to school, Wooddale's Orphan Home. I mean, we had a blessing. Been blessed ever since. Where's the sacrifice? I don't know. I just don't understand what it is that they're sacrificing. And when they come here, I mean, they've got housing. They eat too much. It's a 50-pound school. Did you know that? Where's the sacrifice? And if I think that way, is there something wrong with the way I'm thinking? You think it was a sacrifice when he said to John, come and follow me. John left his fishing business. But if it's not easy, you see, I don't want anything to do with it. I think the evidence that we have watered down Christianity is that the wicked do not persecute us. They just ignore us. I love to go into a small town, stop at the gas station and say, could you direct me to the Church of Christ? And when the guy starts telling me, oh, you people think you're the only ones going to heaven, I know my brethren have been there. Because they've got him all upset. And rightfully so. He's not ignoring us anymore. He knows now what the truth is. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Not just persecuted, but for a very special reason. It does not say, blessed are they that are persecuted because they are objectionable, obnoxious people. It says, for righteousness' sake. What is righteousness? Doing what God told you to do. Yeah. Let's read that. 1 John 2, 29. First John 3, 7. doesn't say we're persecuted because we're objectionable. 
I know a fellow who thinks he's being mistreated and persecuted because he objects to everything the church wants to do. Well, I'm being mistreated. Well, I don't know who died and made him boss, but evidently he thinks he did become boss. It doesn't say, blessed are those who are persecuted because they are difficult personalities. I know about difficult personalities. I have one. Uh, Well, that doesn't say that. It doesn't say, Keith, you're being persecuted because you have a difficult personality. It says because you're practicing righteousness. It doesn't say, blessed are they who are persecuted because they lack wisdom or are being foolish. A preacher in this area was in jail because he got into a brawl in a street fight. I read the other day that someone said, never argue with a fool in public because the Spectators won't know which one of you is the fool. It does not say blessed is the man that is persecuted because he's prejudiced. Archie Bunker. It doesn't say blessed are those who are persecuted because they're fanatics. Let's go to 1 Peter 4.15. First Peter four fifteen. No, let's not be murdering. Or a busybody, or a busybody in other men's matters. That's seven words, right? It's one word in the original. Yes. Episcopos anthropos. It's a combination of the word bishop and mankind. Episcopos bishop, anthropos, anthropology, mankind. Who made you that fellow's bishop? Who made you his boss? Don't ever suffer for that reason. You don't want to be a murderer or a thief, but what about a busybody in other men's matters? None of my business. Well, you know, it's in the church we have this idea that everybody's business is everybody's business. The very first time I ever waited on the Lord's table, I said in the prayer for the bread, we thank thee for thy body broken for us on the cross. And boy, here she came. I just was quoting from 1 Corinthians 11, the only passage I knew. Here she came. She said, don't you know, young man, that a bone of his body was never broken? What's wrong with you to make a prayer like that? And I said, well, ma'am, I didn't know that, but I wouldn't be so rude as you are to speak to me that way. Now, you've got to remember, I'm about a two-week-old Christian, so I wasn't being very nice either. But she said, well, in the church, we come and straighten our brothers out when they're wrong. And I said, oh, I said, well, I wouldn't be that rude. Let's go to Galatians 6, 1, please. I don't know where we ever got this idea that everybody's business is everybody's business, but the scriptures don't teach it. Well, if you're helping them, that's a different story. I don't know how you could help that. Do you want me to help you? What you got on the first slide? Somebody, please. I don't know what I called out now. Galatians 6 1. My brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, now notice this fellow didn't start out to do whatever it was he got overtaken in, it caught up with him. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. In the spirit of meekness, consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. 
Now, how many people in this room are the spiritual in this verse? The verse doesn't say that every Christian should help him. It says, ye which are spiritual. Now, in the first century church, who were the spiritual, please? This is a miraculous term. This verse, uh, this has to do with a person who had the miraculous ability to discern a spirit. Is there anybody in this room who has that ability, please? See, everybody's business isn't everybody's business, folks. In order to apply this today, I would have to have somebody who understood the person's problem and then go to him and help him. It would be great to have people who are trained in those areas to help various kinds of things. Some people say, would you counsel us? I said, no, I'm not qualified in that area. You have to know your limitations. This doesn't say everybody should go to that person. It says ye which are spiritual should go. And that takes some training with some folks. I can practice verse 2. I can help carry your burden. But I need some special training to go and help this fellow overcome his fault. I might encourage him to go and see somebody who has that kind of training. I'm just making the point that everybody's business isn't everybody's business. And some of us have even felt guilty because we didn't go to a certain person when we weren't in having, we don't have the ability to go to him. We started the work teams down at South Haven, the visitation teams, and we gave this card to this brother, <laughs> and he went to the fellow's house and said, I got your card, that's why I came. <laughs> so I said, don't give him that anymore until we train him. I don't know what that fellow thought. I got your card, that's why I came. Anyway, everybody's business isn't everybody's business. Let's not suffer as a busybody in other men's matters. What a wonderful thought. And so if I'm persecuted because of that, then that's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is to Keith, here's what to expect if you really live the Christian life. Well, evidently I've sold the Christian life short because I've faced very little persecution. Very little. Look at 2 Timothy 3.12. How come we're worried about the Islamic terrorists? What is it they do to Christians? They behead them, do they not? 2 Timothy 3.12. A brother said to me in all good faith one time, he was very sincere about what he said, but he said, you know, I don't understand. He said, the early church found favor with all the people. Why don't we? Acts 2.47. I said, you didn't read far enough into Acts. Get over to the fourth chapter and see what happened when the public found out what they were really teaching. When the Jews figured out what it was they were saying, what happened? They started imprisoning them and beating them and persecuting them. And so when we start to live the godly life and people begin to understand it, they'll say things, sometimes very ugly things. What is it? If you're like Christ, they'll persecute you. Look at John 15, 19 and 20, please. John 15, 19 and 20. Get a reader, please. John 15, 19 and 20. Brother Bynum, are you a good reader? Okay. John 15. Brother Bynum's our, a brand new student here. I thought about persecution 
And the first one that came to my mind was Abel, who by faith offered a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain did. Cain became so angry that God did not accept his that he actually murdered his brother. Wasn't Abel persecuted for righteousness sake? I thought about Moses. Sometimes Moses brought his the persecution on himself. I, I recall when he killed an Egyptian. Uh, that's not persecuted for righteousness sake. Moses fled, you remember? For 40 years, he stayed away from Egypt. But oh, how he was persecuted. Not by the Egyptians, but by his own people. In fact, he got so angry, angry, you remember, that he did something. He struck a rock twice. Now, why is that such a grievous sin? Because that rock was a type of Christ, and Christ only died once, not twice. Moses violated the type, and when he violated the type, he didn't get to go to the promised land. He wasn't kept out of the promised land because he was angry. And just because he disobeyed God, he violated the type of the Christ. He blasphemed the God of heaven. And he missed heaven. Moses lost it even though he was persecuted. I think about Elijah. Great prophet. Not a writing prophet, but a great prophet. But oh, how Jezebel hated him. And everywhere he went, she was after him, trying to kill him. He got so upset and so distressed, he finally told God, you know, I'm the only one standing. God said, no, Elijah. There's 7,000 people out here have not bowed to Baal. But oh, how Elijah was persecuted. He almost quit, did he not? Think about Elijah. I think about Daniel. Daniel didn't do anything extraordinary. He just did what he did every day. He prayed three times a day. Ended up in the lion's den because of that. And a law that Nebuchadnezzar had passed. Lions evidently weren't hungry. (laughs) I've never been thrown in a lion's den. How about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? What happened to them? Thrown in a fiery furnace? Why? You know, when that statue of Nebuchadnezzar went by and they were supposed to bow down to it, wouldn't that have been a good time to bend over and tie your shoes? They didn't bend over and tie their shoes. Where did they end up? Somebody was in that furnace walking with them. One like the Son of Man. I have an idea who that is, but maybe not. Maybe just an angel, but maybe the second person of the Godhead, too. But they were persecuted. Paul, you ever persecuted? Read 2 Corinthians 11. And then the care of all the churches he adds to the list. fellow was stoned, whipped, beaten. Never quit. Suppose somebody had been standing out front of this building this morning with a machine gun and said, you go in there, I'm going to kill you. Would you come in? You heard about the fellows that broke into the church building with the machine guns and told everybody, if you're going to stand for Christ, we're going to murder you. If you want to leave, go ahead and leave. About half the congregation left. They threw down their machine guns and said, well, we've gotten rid of the hypocrites. Let's worship. I come to the Lord now, don't I? They came on a holy day, which was illegal. On the word of one of his own gang, which was illegal. And they arrested him at night, which was illegal. They took him to Annas, who was not the legal high high priest at that time, Caiaphas was. The Romans had deposed Annas. 
illegal to take him to the high priest first. Should have taken him to a lower member of the court first. It was illegal. Everything they did was illegal. It was so strange. They took him to Pilate, but they didn't want to come near the building lest they touched it and be unclean for the holy day. But they'd have their fellow Jew murdered. You ever wonder why they didn't just stone him? They could have under Roman law. Why didn't they? They wanted him persecuted. They wanted him tortured. And that's exactly what crucifixion did. You remember what he said? Father, what? Forgive them. The sad thing about persecution is it's not confined to the world. It's not just the world. Who were the biggest persecutors of the Christ but religious people? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. I always ask the young people, do you know the difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee? Well, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the others didn't, so they were sad, you see. Acts 23.8. The Sadducees were the liberals of the day, the high priests. The Pharisees were laymen, we call them, but legalists. In fact, they added over 600 laws to Moses' law codified it in a book called the Talmud, made up of two books called the Mishnah and the Gemara. But those great religious people were Jesus' biggest persecutors. Pilate didn't see anything dishonest or evil in Christ, but they did. Persecution is not confined to those in the world. Paul was persecuted by the Jews, not the world. and by his own brethren. When Paul started the church in Corinth, the Judaizers came in and started to change everything. You people need to be circumcised and obey the law of Moses as well as being baptized, and so you're not real Christians. The Galatian churches, the same thing happened. You remember he told those brethren in Galatia, Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should be so soon removed. Before whose eyes Christ was evidently set. They had eyeball evidence, miraculous gift, that they were under the right system. But the, the own brethren, these Jewish people who had been baptized in missionary sins, began to persecute the church. In the Thessalonican letter, if you'll turn over there a moment to the chapter 3 of the first letter, The Apostle says something that has always struck me about what would help him stand in the faith. Look at verse 8 of chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. Paul knew about this congregation. He started it, of course, and he had to go, and he was on his way down toward Corinth, and he was worried about them. But notice what he says here. For now we live. If ye stand fast in the faith. The first gospel meeting I ever got to hold was back in Fort Wayne, Indiana. 1973, I was a first-year student here, and I got asked to come back up there. That probably was the worst gospel meeting they ever had. but It really taught me something, because when I got back there, and I'd only been down here about a year, some people weren't there that I used to know were there. Where's so-and-so? Oh, they quit. Where's so-and-so? Well, we went and visited those folks. They were very cordial to me, but they were very cold toward the church and Christ. I'm still talking about that, what, 43 years later? It hurt when our brothers and sisters quit. And Paul said, I live if you stand fast in the Lord. Paul knew that the Thessalonican brethren were being persecuted, and he was concerned about them. But then I have to ask myself, why? Why am I being persecuted? Simply because I'm different. Yes, Jim.
Do you remember the Jewel Miller film strip? That's what they showed me back in 1964. And <coughs> somewhere in there, the fellow asked me, <coughs> he said, Keith, have you ever told a lie? I said, of course. He said, then you're a liar. Well, I didn't like that a bit. I said, you can leave my house right now. He said, wait a minute. Did you ever take anything that belonged to you? I said, of course. He said, then you're a thief. I didn't like that either. But you know, the Bible teaches that. And I needed to repent of that stuff. Maybe it's the problem I had of not thinking of myself the way I should. So I'm going to tell you I don't like what I'm hearing. But Jerry's describing what happens when you teach someone what happens. Eventually, they're going to come against you because they're not going to like what they're hearing. I always ask people, what are you going to do if the Bible teaches you something with, that you're not doing or with which you disagree? What are you going to do? And so, I asked that somewhere in the study. Yeah. So I always ask them toward the end of the study, is there something I can do to talk you out of this? When they say they want to be baptized? I want to know if they're really converted. You know, some people are afraid of that question. I'm not afraid of it at all. And, you, and 99 times out of 100, they'll say, no, sir. And I say, I know we're all right. They're all right. What was it about Christ that condemned the Pharisees? Why were they so angry with him? Didn't he make their religion look shabby? You're not good enough. Look at Matthew 5, 17, right here in your text. Uh, not 17. I'm sorry. Uh, verse 20. Except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. <laughs> they have a shabby religion. It was just to be seen of men, wasn't it? Well, when that came home to them, he signed his death certificate. I don't remember that Daniel said anything that upset Nebuchadnezzar, but what he was did, and it upset the idolaters of Nebuchadnezzar's day. Look at Luke 6.26, brothers and sisters. Luke 6.26. Who would I, would I say? Persian king, I'm sorry. Yeah. Darius. Darius is faster. Why couldn't it be Nebuchadnezzar? Then I wouldn't have been wrong. No, he got caught up in his law. Yeah. yeah. So not so much what Daniel did, but what he was. That's what I was making the point. And he doesn't agree with that, so. Well, we're out of fellowship now, brother. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Luke six twenty six. Anybody? Luke six twenty six. Somebody. That's hard to accept, isn't it? I want everybody to be friendly to me. Not going to happen, Keith. Not going to happen. A Christian is persecuted because of what he is. And that's just that simple. He lives by a different standard. The world says get all you can while you can. A Christian doesn't live by that standard. I knew a fellow at work, one of my supervisors, way back when, when I was actually working and not preaching, who was like that. His idea was, live it up. You only go around once. The social life of a Christian is different. The work life of a Christian is different. 
the home life of a Christian is different. And because he's different, he's persecuted. What's the cost of building my character? I become different. I'm not just slightly different. I'm essentially different. I have a different standard. Hopefully, my loyalty to Christ is above everything else, except, of course, the Godhead, 1 Corinthians 15. But hopefully, my life is controlled and dominated by Jesus for his sake. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 9, folks. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Got church discipline on my mind there. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Notice Paul's goal. That's his goal. They may be accepted of Christ. One translation says, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and what? To die is gain. My thoughts hopefully are controlled by the Christ. Great is our reward in heaven. Rejoice and be blessed are, blessed are you and men shall revile you, persecute you, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. There's the goal. Then he says rejoice. Right. I'm being persecuted? Yes. Kick up your heels. Wow. There's no blessing in just feeling different. It's when I am different that I'm persecuted. You remember the name Polycarp. And you remember that he was burned at the stake. But before they burned him, they gave him an opportunity to renounce the Christ. Here's what he said. Thirty-six years have I served Christ. He has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? O Lord God Almighty, the Father of they, thy well-beloved and ever-blessed Son, by whom we have received the knowledge of thee, I thank thee. Thou hast generously thought me worthy of this day and of this hour. Thank you for your kind attention.